Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. Today's webinar is entitled <clears throat> Protracted Displacement, the Search for Solutions, Promising Programs and Strategies, a webinar on the special issue of the Journal on Migration and Human Security. <clears throat> Thank you for being here today. The collection features 11 papers, which focus on several large and several less publicized populations and protracted displacement. <clears throat> the articles can be found at cmsny.org. <clears throat> Today, we have two editors of the volume, Donald Curran, editor of the Journal of Migration and Human Security and former executive director of Center for Migration Studies, and guest editor Elizabeth Ferris, who is the director of the Institute for the Study of International Migration at Georgetown University. They will give remarks and moderate each of our two panels, which are comprised of select authors from the collection. The first panel will examine protracted refugee situations and solutions, and the second panel will look at protracted internal displacement situations and solutions. At the end of the first panel, there will be a short question and answer session, and at the end of the second panel, another round of questions, which will go longer. <clears throat> to ask a question, please write it in the chat box, and we'll try to get to as many as we can. <clears throat> so now I'd like to introduce our first speaker, our first special guest, <clears throat> Kim Mancini. Kim is the legal advisor to the Special Rapporteur on the Human Rights of Inter Internally Displaced Persons. She works in Geneva as part of UNHCR's Division of International Protection. Kim is a legal professional with 20 years of national and international experience on forced displacement as a lawyer, legal advisor, durable solutions advisor, and facilitator of protection learning. Her work as in, in, on internal displacement has included her current work with UNHCR and previous work with the Danish Refugee Council, the, the Norwegian Refugee Council's Internal Displacement Monitoring Center, as well as collaborative work with the Council of Europe and the Global Protection Cluster. <clears throat> Kim will speak for five to 10 minutes and give us an opening view of this important issue. And once Kim has completed her remarks, Donald Kerwin will begin the first panel. So Kim, welcome and thank you for being here. Thanks so much, Kevin. Uh, sincere thanks for inviting the Special Rapporteur to the, uh, on the Human Rights of Internally Displaced Persons to be part of the event. Uh, Paula Gaviria Betancourt, who's been a mandate holder since last November, is not available today, but I'm happy to open with some reflections from the perspective of the mandate, which is focused on an dialogue, promotion, and advancing international human protection and human rights norms related to IDPs. Um, this really is a critical time for academic researchers to foster creative thinking about solutions to protracted displacement. The magnitude, of course, of refugee and internal displacement keeps growing, uh, but the space and the avenues for solutions are not keeping pace. Um, this special issue tells us protracted displacement situations are the reasons for the unprecedented numbers of refugees and IDPs in the world. At the end of 2021, UNHCR considered 74% of the world's refugees to be in protracted situations. Just last week, the Internal Displacement Monitoring Center reported that 62 million people were displaced because of conflict and violence uh, in 65 countries at the end of 2022. This is a 17% increase from the year before, and most of these countries are dealing with protracted displacement. So the timing for the Journal of Migration and Human Security to focus on this issue is excellent for helping to bridge uh, the global, regional, and country level policy making and practitioner experience. Um, and they're paying attention. Uh, this December, we know that there's the second Global Refugee Forum coming up. Um, this we're, we're expecting um, experience from countries around the world to be shared and progress on the global compact for refugees, uh, as well as on the pledges. Um, what we know in terms of refugee and internal displacement in the Americas, uh, under the Comprehensive Regional Protection and Solutions Framework, the MERPS, um, you know, the approach is to promote a coordinated regional response to forced displacement, which includes um, tackling refugee and internal displacement holistically in some countries. Um, 
I personally feel compelled to thank you uh, and thank the journal for this issue and the webinar on behalf of many IDP stakeholders. Uh, right now, the UN and interagency systems really are mobilized in an unprecedented way since last summer under the Secretary General's Action Agenda on Internal Displacement. I'm pretty sure this is as exciting as it gets in Geneva <laughs> in terms of global. Um, uh, I would say that with the special advisor on solutions, Robert Piper, uh, working uh, with UN country teams, governments, development partners in 16 pilot countries to try to find new ways to progress at scale on pathways to solutions to internal displacement is, is, is an exciting time. Um, in the first, this is still his first year. And uh, what we know is that he's testing, um, and his team, he and his team is testing a model based on four building blocks. Um, strong government leadership arrangements, a new generation of solutions, strategies that are anchored in national development plans, financing framework, and uh, a roadmap and core uh, solutions roadmap and coordination arrangements. So those are those building blocks. And so this webinar personally could not be, uh, so uh, couldn't be more timely. Um, one thing that we expect in the second year of this two-year mandate is that it will culminate into a, a global event uh, in which uh, we can expect commitments from governments, UN, international financing institutions, civil society, um, in respect of internal displacement and solutions to internal displacement. So uh, for her part, the special rapporteur on the human rights of IDPs has her humanitarian protection and human rights focus. And she will be uh, engaging on root causes, generalized violence in particular, including criminal violence, uh, the adverse effects of climate change, which as we all know is affecting refugee and internal displacement worldwide, and uh, peace building and uh, peace processes. Um, as well as criteria related to uh, sustainable integration and reintegration of IDPs. So there is a lot of learning to take across the uh, internal and refugee displacement spectrum. One of the guiding considerations uh, in the Secretary General's action agenda, which I think needs heightened reflection um, and where this webinar comes in extremely well, is the call uh, for action on internal displacement to be part of the whole of displacement approach, which is essentially about considering the rights and needs of individuals who also fled across inter international borders, individuals who returned after cross-border displacements and host communities. So um, I think that it's pretty clear that this issue speaks uh, well to this and that there are some important uh, policymakers and practitioners who need <laughs> to have these talks. and. Um, the, the, the thinking that will uh, kick off and continue is, is, is going to be an excellent thing. Um, on that note, I'm going to hand over to back to, uh, to Kevin. No, not to Kevin, but to Kevin. Yes, maybe, or Don. I'm not sure. But thank you very much for having us. Thank you, Kim, very much for being with us. And thanks for the great work of the special rapporteur. And it's very inspiring to listen to you. To, to your plans and kind of what you're involved in on, on this issue. Um, thanks to CMS as well, to Kevin uh, for hosting us today. And um, just a, a word to Elizabeth Ferris, who's been kind of my partner in this project. It's been great to work with her. And of course, she's a, a great expert on this issue and I've learned a lot from her and really uh, proud and happy to have partnered with her on this. Um, so this panel will feature four papers that address protracted refugee situations. The next panel, which Beth will be moderating, um, will cover mostly situations of protracted internal displacement, although not exclusively. So before I introduce the authors, let me speak to a few themes in this special issue. I mean, as Kim, Kim outlined them quite well, but we have nearly three quarters of the world's refugees are in protracted situations defined as refugees and national groups of at least 25,000 who've been exiled in a lower middle income country for at least five consecutive years. This definition under, actually understates the numbers in protracted situations. It's probably larger than that. And the question arises, you know, why do we have protracted situations? How have they become the norm rather than the exception? And it's, it's not due, we find, solely to the inadequacies of state responses to existing refugee situations. 
of course, states and the international community um, also need to do more to prevent, in a lot of cases, just forego refugee situations. Um, developed states clearly need to invest sufficient political will and resources for refugees, and allow them access to their territories. And as just as a practical matter, there, there are challenges. It takes time for refugee producing conditions to resolve themselves or to be resolved. For host communities, it takes time to build the infrastructure, governance capacity, systems and relationships to address the needs of refugees. And for refugees, it takes time to find an acceptable permanent situation. As we know, the traditional durable solutions for refugees, safe and voluntary return, and um, local integration and third country settlement, they're in short supply. And these uh, permanent solutions don't keep pace with the number of new refugees or those who remain in protracted situations year in and out and often over multiple generations. In 2021, only 7% of the world's forcibly displaced, including refugees, could access durable solutions of any kind. That's a fairly extraordinary figure. The papers in this collection highlight creative ways to expand and complement these traditional solutions, but we find that new solutions have been difficult to come by. Just a few kind of themes from this special issue. The papers emphasize the importance of refugee agency and refugee-led initiatives. That'll be a theme of this panel as well. They stress the need to remove barriers to refugee self-reliance and to facilitate integration through work, education, housing, and healthcare, including mental health services. They underscore the importance of opening traditional legal migration pathways to refugees, such as for work, to join family members, to study, and for humanitarian reasons. They emphasize the importance of building strong relationships between host and refugee communities. Relations can be strengthened by making services for refugees available to members of host communities. And of course, the papers also speak to the need to integrate systems created for refugees, such as healthcare, into systems that are available to host communities. They discuss the need to move away from encampment strategies, and they're wary of pursuing durable solutions that don't improve the situations of refugees, such as, of course, returning them to dangerous situations or to situations of effectively internal displacement. Overall, they emphasize the ways in which protracted situations are both a consequence and a cause of human insecurity. Um, the, they're guardedly hopeful but also clear about the human toll of protracted displacement and insistent on the need for greater attention to this really momentous problem. So let me, let me having said all of that, let me introduce our terrific speakers and authors now. The first speaker is Ludger Pries of Ruhr University, Bochum. He and Verna Safak Zulfakar Savshi, and I know I've botched that name, um, contributed a paper titled Between Humanitarian Assistance Externalizing of EU Borders, EU Turkey Deal, and Refugee Related Organizations in Turkey. Ludger will be followed by Abdurrahman Muhammad of Jijiga University, Abdurrahman and Rose Jaji of the German Institute of Development and Sustainability, produced a paper titled Somali Refugees Informality and self-initiative at local integration in Ethiopia and Kenya. Watfa Najdi of the Center for Lebanese Studies will speak next. Wafta Arub El Abid and Mustafa Hashman have written a paper titled Patterns of Refugees, Organization and Protracted Displacement, an Understanding from Jordan, Lebanon, and Turkey. And the last presentation in this panel will be from Mohamed Azizul Hook of the Center for Peace and Justice, Brock University, he'll introduce a short video on a paper titled Community-Based Research in Fragile Contexts, Reflections from Rohingya Refugee Camps in Cox's Bazaar, Bangladesh. On the video will be the co-authors of that paper, Taznuva Ahmed, Samira Mansour, and Tasnia Kandakur Prova. Each speaker, unfortunately, is only going to be able to speak for around five to seven minutes, and we'll take questions at the end of all of the presentations, not at the end of each presentation. So let me turn it over to Ludger now, 
and thank you all for joining us today. Okay, thank you very much for this kind invitation and the huge project of the special issue. If you could open my screen or allow me to share my screen. I prepared some three slides, so it would be easier. Anybody can allow me to share my screen? Kevin? Uh, I think you can go ahead and share it. Is it, is it prohibiting you from doing that? No, I, it's deactivated. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Hold on. Let us, let us work on that, okay? You should be able to share your screen. No. It's deactivated still. I'm sorry, but. Try and see if you can share your screen now. Now it's now it works. Yes, thank you. So I, I just to to be short, I I prepared a presentation, a short presentation of our article that I wrote with Bernard Silvica, uh, my colleague here at Bochum University in social science, and and we wrote about the EU Turkey deal and especially the refugee related organizations in Turkey. So it's only one aspect of this very much discussed um, EU Turkey deal. And um, the situation is simply that uh, forced protracted displacement in Syria, all of us know is almost the most, one of the most important in volume all over the world. See 6.7 million, uh, IDPs and 6.8 million refugees, more or less. And this is even in the very narrow, uh, Don, you mentioned this, in the very narrow definition of uh, protracted displacement, five years, 25,000. This is for many, many years. This is the graph that shows us that even uh, for uh, almost 10 years, we have a very huge number of uh, registered Syrian refugees. So the question we put is, how worked the EU-Turkey deal of March 2016? Uh, how uh, was it, uh, the budgeting and the management of this fund? The main aim is not to paint the world in black and white. This is quite easy to put the way the world in black and white, but to, to have a more shadowed a view on uh, the pros and cons of this EU Turkey deal. What was uh, the payment of the European Union to the Turkish government uh, just only for externalizing its responsibilities of refugee protection or an appropriate measure for sharing the burden of an urgent humanitarian crisis? Second question was the money spent for refugee oriented humanitarian aid and development expenses or was it mainly instrumentalized by the Turkish government for its own ends? This is one of the big critiques. And finally, who decided of, on money spending? How did refugee related international non-governmental and governmental organizations participate in this? Um, just a few words on the uh, deal. Uh, the EU Turkey statement or deal worked from 2016 to 2020. Uh, it was the biggest EU humanitarian and development fund ever, 6 billion euros. Um, and um, as a comparison, we have some 1 billion uh, additional million, uh, humanitarian EU funding from 2012 to 2022, so it's 10 years. And um, the EU as a whole remains the largest donor with almost 25 billion of humanitarian stabilization and resilience assistance 
collectively mobilized since the onset of the crisis in 2011 to address its consequences. So I think for Europe, obviously, this is a very uh, hot topic. And the main instrument was the so-called FRIT um, facility for refugees in Turkey, response to needs of refugees and of host communities. And uh, this in six priority areas, humanitarian assistance, education, health, municipal infrastructure, social economic support, and migration management. So let's see how uh, is the balance after five years, or how was the balance in 2021? Uh, Amnesty International argued the EU-Turkey deal has been an abject failure. The EU and its member states have failed to take responsibility for people seeking safety in Europe. And obviously, one part of this argument I fully uh, agree with, and I think uh, scientifically we can underline it, but it's not the whole story. Um, the president, Ursula von der Leyen of the European Union, says, despite significant and sustained criticism of the EU-Turkey deal from human rights advocates and humanitarian organizations, Leaders on both sides have continued to show interest in maintaining at least some version of its central commitments. Um, and uh, she, she says that the deal remains valid and has brought positive results. So what could be considered as positive results, if any, besides all the justified critiques? One justified critique, I think, is that only some 200,000 naturalized Syrian refugees uh, are registered or were registered in Turkey in 2023. So it's a smaller, very small part of all refugees that are now naturalized in Turkey. Only some 28,000 Syrian refugees were taken in by the EU based on the EU-Turkey deal since 2016. This is nothing as compared to the high numbers. Erdogan government took Syrians as a bargaining chip uh, uh, severely, uh, I think there's no doubt about it. And also, it's obvious that the EU member states, uh, in great to a great extent, all of them followed what I call organized non-responsibility, not to take care of the situation. But there are some lessons to learn from the EU-Turkey deal from our point and our results that we uh, found out in a three years a study where we also had a survey with uh, Syrian refugees, etc. The money was mainly spent for humanitarian and development uh, assistance and not for the Turkish government. We show this in the article here, just table two, the general average, average uh, budget, the number of projects in the different areas I mentioned before of the so-called FRIT. Second, the situation of protracted displacement in Turkey was pulled into an international organizational er arena. It was uh, put, uh, not marginalized, but put on the uh, top uh, agenda of almost all of the internationally relevant organizations. Here you see the list of the international organizations active in the deal. Uh, and this is the who is who of international refugee protection and humanitarian assistance. You could find almost all relevant organizations. Third, different types of national and international non-governmental and governmental organizations participated in managing the projects. Here you see uh, uh, the, the different participating organizations organized by international government or organizations, EU organizations, Turkish organizations, etc. And we see in the percentage of the budget, but all in, also in the number of projects, that this was more or less an, a quite a differentiated distribution between all these organizations that were obliged to cooperate. This also is, was innovative to a certain extent. Finally, for, fourth, projects were basically key, basically located where the Syrian refugees lived and where the money actually was needed. This is um, an overview uh, showed in detail in, the, in, the, in our article, where we find uh, the more than 10,000 uh, projects, specific projects distributed over locations in Turkey. And these correspond, uh, associate more or less 
with the concentration of re uh, Syrian refugees in Turkey. Finally, according to our expert interviews that we did in Turkey, cooperation between diverse refugee-related organizations was mostly successful despite some ineffective coordination between the projects. We know these critiques uh, um, from all international interventions in humanitarian crisis and development activities. There were a lot of ineffective coordination or of coordination that was not effective. But uh, despite this, uh, most of our expert interview interviewees agreed that uh, the refugee-related uh, organizations were quite successful in general. So this was part of uh, some insights uh, of our articles. Thank you for your attention. But sorry for my cold. It was the worst cold I caught during the last 10 years. I think this is Corona-related. Oh, you sounded great. Thank you. And thank you for that terrific presentation and paper. Um, so. Abdurrahman, can you can you jump in now? Yes, thank you, um, Don, and thanks to the CMS for having us today. So I will uh, immediately start the keynotes that I wanted to share in this event. Um, my colleague is also uh, with us, host Chachi here. So um, to begin with, as a dear solution, uh, resettlement has become a rare solution to refugee crisis. And repatriation is not an option for many refugees uh, given the situation in their places of origin. As a result, integration has been depicted as the only durable solution option for many refugees globally. Yet the countries in the global south that continue to accommodate new influx of refugees, as well as protracted situations, is still practice encampment policies, leaving refugees in protracted situations and dashing the hopes for implementing the local integration policies to improve the livelihoods of the refugees hosted in those countries. However, the absence of local integration policies or lack of the implementation of those policies do not necessarily leave refugees in a state of helplessness. Contrary to the official encampment policies and scholarships that assume that uh, absence of official integration policies terrorist integration, many refugees have to find solutions and let their lives as active and productive members of their host countries. Refugees uh, are a resourceful actors that have sustained themselves in difficult situations. And with the support of the host community, they have been informally integrated, even when policies uh, dictated the opposite. And this is the case in many situations that we will discuss. So uh, to demonstrate this argument, we take the Somali refugees in Kenya and Ethiopia as a case. Ethiopia and Kenya together host the largest Somali refugees, around 530,000 um, currently. And we argue in this article that the absence of local integration policies or the reluctance to uh, implement these policies in the areas we um, emphasize it uh, does not necessarily uh, translate uh, the fact that refugees are unable to integrate in uh, their host country. The reality is actually the opposite. Um, so looking at the status of durable solution policy, uh, solution is policies in these countries. In Ethiopia, we have a progressive policy that lacks implementation. Like Ethiopia has drafted the comprehensive refugee response framework in 2016, immediately after the new declaration, and have promised it around nine pledges as the way they wanted to integrate refugees. Continuing to this effort, Ethiopia, uh, the Ethiopian parliament has passed uh, a new refugee law in 2019, which offered more rights to the refugees. The implementation of this policy remains very sluggish. It's more on the documents, but practically refugees remain to be in the camps despite the policy which dictates um, and offers um, out of camp uh, movement, which allows the out of camp movement. Uh, in Kenya, on the other hand, the refugee policies are inconsistent with the practices on the ground. On one hand, the government of Kenya pursues to local integration programs, and they have passed the Kenya Refugee Act in 2021. On the other hand, the refugees, specifically the Somali refugees, are perceived as a security threat, and they should be repatriated. So that's the common, um, that's the, the reality on the ground contrary to the policy that Kenya wants to pursue. So in such situations where 
governments literally pursue to none of the three durable solutions. Informality enables refugees to circumvent the host country's refugee policies by relying on the social relationships uh, with the host communities. Informality makes it easier for the refugees to integrate and defy the refugee encampment policy. This is partly made possible because of uh, the fact that in most of the border regions, uh, most of the border regions are occupied by ethnic people who share um, ethnic similarity, who live also on both sides of the border, and therefore they share kinship, marriage, religious, and business and political relationships. So, in spite of legal stalemate, where countries who have into, uh, local integration policies are not implementing uh, these policies. Uh, this, uh, in terms of finding durable solution, the refugees in Ethiopia and Kenya have resorted to these informal structures and channels as avenues towards a social, cultural, and economic integration. Solution is found by the refugees in the host communities most of the time remain to be invisible because they are overshadowed by the fact that the countries that host the refugees do not practically pursue to the any of the three durable solutions. In this regard, it's important that we depart from the thinking that refugees are incapable of finding any solutions within the host government policies. And instead, we need to focus on and study um, the self-initiative, the resourcefulness, and also the informality, the role of informality in sustaining the lives of refugees in these countries. Um, we recommend uh, policies that build on shared needs and interests between the refugees and host communities and also on the social dynamics in the regions that host refugees. Uh, finally, we need to think outside the box uh, of three durable solutions, and we need to seek solutions in the informal structures and unofficial activities that occur in uh, the initiative of the refugees themselves with the support of uh, host communities. Um, with this, I will give the platform back to um, uh, Don. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. It's a fascinating story of the lack of local integration policies not being kind of the end of the story, particularly given affinities between refugees and the groups where they settle, ethnic and other affinities. Um, so, Watfa, can we turn to you now? Um, sure. Uh, thank you, Don. I'm going to try to share my screen. Um, let me see if that's going to. Can you see it now? OK, perfect. Um, all right, so. Second. OK, so and 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 the five minutes that I five or seven minutes that I have, I will uh, briefly introduce uh, our paper, which looks at the patterns of refugee uh, led organizations in protracted displacement. Uh, the paper focuses on three countries, Lebanon, Jordan, and Turkey. Um, and uh, the reason that we wanted to look into uh, or look at refugee-led organizations stems from the particular attention that has been recently paid to the ways that refugees living in protracted displacement manage to mobilize, to advocate for their rights, and to navigate the restrictive environments in which they live. This increased attention came in tandem with a growing recognition within the international humanitarian system of the importance of localization of aid, uh, which refers to the devolving of funding and decision-making processes to local actors. Uh, this was evident in the 2016 World Humanitarian Summit and the Grand Bargain, which invited the international community to fund local actors, including refugee-led entities, in aims to ensure the efficiency and legitimacy of uh, humanitarian services and to help overcome power asymmetries inherent to the top-down global responses. So what we wanted to do in this paper was to question uh, how this recent interest and support has shaped the emergence of new typologies of refugee uh, organizations and displacement, while taking into account the varied pol policies in each of the host states uh, that we are studying. Um, so in order to identify these typologies, we wanted to understand the barriers and enablers of refugee organizations. 
Uh, to do so, we relied on Ling and Dale's equation of agency, which helped us unpack why, when, and how refugees use their agency to mobilize or to establish organizations. In addition to capacity, uh, common concern and social capital constituted the enablers of refugee organization, while the barriers mostly consisted of the restrictive policies and registration processes imposed by the uh, host countries. So, um, for example, despite hosting a considerable number of refugees throughout their histories, Lebanon, Jordan and Turkey, uh, do not have a consistent uh, pol a policy towards uh, refugee populations uh, they host. Uh, this lack of consensus, mostly attributed to issues around political power and policy paralysis, has had a major effect on the rights of refugees and their ability to mobilize as a community. Uh, in addition, while the role of the international humanitarian system has recently been seen through a positive lens uh, and looked at as an enabler of, of refugee-led uh, organizations, it could also be seen as a barrier if we look at the uh, complicated and often complex uh, funding criteria that are imposed on uh, local actors and refugee-led organizations. So knowing that refugees are not a homogenous group, uh, therefore their capacities, reasons to act, and social capital are uh, um, the barriers they, ex they are exposed to uh, vary. This is then reflected in the various typologies and mobilization efforts of uh, refugee-led organizations. To understand this variation, we have attempted to break it down to four layers. Uh, the, uh, I'm going to start from the bottom up. So the first layer being the philanthropic individual initiative. I'm not going to go into each layer just because we're a bit tight on time. The second layer, which is the localized mobility mobilization. Uh, the third layer is the institutionalized community mobilization. And this is when refugee mobilization is pushed towards institutionalizing and becomes established and registered as an organization or as a nonprofit company. Uh, and the, four, uh, the, the first layer uh, is the transnational organization. Uh, so this is when uh, an RLO or a refugee-led organization uh, reaches a, the capacity to work across border, borders and to mobilize their transnational networks. Um, so according to, to these typologies, we disaggregated the 336 RLOs that we mapped in Turkey, Lebanon, and Jordan. Uh, in the three countries, we were able to, to, uh, uh, to map 150 uh, refugee-led organizations in Turkey, uh, 110 in Lebanon, and 90 in, 90 in, in, in Jordan. Um, so ultimately, in, in our attempt to identify uh, the different typologies or patterns of our loans, we aim to inform stakeholders in the humanitarian ecosystem, not only of the value created by RLOs, but also of the ways in which they can be supported. This can be done through encouraging permissive policies and less uh, repressive regulations in host countries, uh, as well as widening or creating more inclusive funding criteria and so on and so forth. So uh, to, include, uh, to, to conclude, I would like to say that um, while the international humanitarian system's recent interest in localization has created a welcoming environment for refugee communities uh, mobilization, this uh, has opened, uh, gone hand in hand with NGOization of locally led efforts. And in the words of Palestinian scholar Islah Rad, uh, the transformation of social movements into NGOs could easily result in the transformation of efforts undertaken to address collective concerns into isolated uh, foreign funded projects, in particular uh, on topics deemed to, of concern by foreign funders. Um, yeah, thank you so much. Thank you. I don't know if I've ever heard that term NGOization. That's a, good, that's a great term, but thank you for that. Thanks for your presentation. Um, Aziz, can we turn to you now? Yes. Um, thank you so much. I would like to get in everyone. Um, I'm excited to share with you a video uh, at some point recording uh, that is featuring me and also my three uh, fellow researchers, Tasnuba, Samira, and Tasnia. We actually discussed here our current work on community-based research in the Fresel context particularly in the Cox Bazaar situation. So before uh, we dive into the conversation, allow me to introduce myself and my institution. 
I am a, a faculty member of the Center for Peace and Justice of Brock University. We are working with different refugee settings, especially in Cox Bazar, Jordan, and Kenya, uh, and also experiencing that the top-down traditional research methodology is not actually helping to understand the real pathology of the social economic problem of the refugee communities, especially. In particular, during the COVID-19, we have observed that uh, when people are not being able to communicate with others, they are confined with a restricted camp, then uh, different rumors, misunderstanding, misperception are flying arrows because they do not have the right place where they can share their opinions. Then we realize that understanding community's perspective and also uh, understanding the community's perception is very much crucial if we would like to respond to the crisis more effectively and efficiently. And then there are lots of things flying around and going around. However, we're thinking what would be the sustainable approach? And then I, uh, we were rem remembering one of the quotation from one of Rohingya youth volunteer. He was saying that, I'm, I'm reading it. We lost all of our resources except our knowledge that has been the only gateway to access our livelihood. Myanmar persecutor couldn't destroy our learned knowledge. So that was really powerful, how we can strengthen the capacity of youth learners so that they can do their research, they can do their real diagnosis of the situation, they can uh, work as advocacy for their socioeconomic and overall development. So now I'm excited to share one of our insights through a video. I would like to share it here. Three of our researchers, including me, discussed. Our work involves implementing community-based research to take refugees and host community youth in and around the camp since 2019. The aim of this paper is to share our research experience and reflect on our innovative community-based research approaches um, targeting the global audience, particularly the academics and the researchers. To provide um, context, the Rohingya crisis in Bangladesh uh, resulted from um, uh, systematic marginalization and persecution of Rohingya population in Myanmar. Um, as a result, approximately 1 million Rohingya population sought uh, refuge in Cox's Bazar camps near the Myanmar-Bangladesh border. Uh, these refugees face uh, numerous challenges including um, limited access to uh, education and livelihood opportunities impacting particularly the children and the youth. When we uh, initiated our work in the camps, we realized that the traditional research approaches were not adequate in these settings uh, due to high trust deficit, trauma and vulnerability among the Rohingya population. So in response to this crisis in a fragile context like the refugee setting, it is really important to have a very good relationship between the researcher and the community people. But if you are outsider, it is not really easy to have a bit, very good relationship with them. They will not share all of their information, what is, is necessary to have a good diagnosis of the pathology of the problems. Trust is key when engaging with community members and community members should be at the heart of what we're doing. Mutual respect and dignity is of utmost importance, and we need to be cognizant of the fact that many humanitarian agencies and local communities tend to take advantage of local uh, refugees. Uh, limited access to services and uh, difficulty in meeting their needs created a gap between the service providers and the communities. Uh, um, rumors and misperception during COVID-19 pandemic um, exacerbated the crisis, intensifying the trust uh, deficit. So then um, we have innovated a number of approaches, especially the trust network, WhatsApp chat hour and port analysis. If you read our research paper, you can know detail this. But now I would like to explain about the trust network. So when we see that trust is very important issues and people are not talking with us, then we have conducted a trust study to understand what are the trust dynamics and who are the trusted people within the Rohingya community. And then we have hired 40 Rohingya young volunteers as a researcher. We have trained them 
in research in different writing a process and also the reading a process and empower them how to create a trust network within the Rohingya community and then uh, they have identified around 4,000 people within their block and camp uh, including the religious leader volunteers uh, teachers community people day labor whatever they are with whom they have a uh, connections they have regular interactions and then they were engaged with the community people in a open and very informal conversation just to understand what is their emerging concerns and questions these projects really helps them to understand their very true and honest confession of their problems and what is their exactly opinion they would like to amplify through this research for the humanitarian agency or the policy makers researchers must also respect uh, religious and community beliefs of the refugees that they engage with and must also provide um, mentoring facilities for the refugees to grow and after organizing all the information they also engage in a pod analysis where uh, the all the fellow researchers who are sharing their opinions their interpretations and their analysis not as the innovator but also as exactly the researchers and they have created a pieces of analytical reports for the researcher of center for peace and justice in Prague university and then when we have drafted this report we again shared this report with the community people so that they can see whether the information accurately reflected or not and they can give us the feedback finally um, providing interpretation trans Translation facilities is also a method of connecting with the refugees completely. And at the end of it, when we have a research output, we must prioritize sharing it with the community in order to establish transparency, community engagement, and credibility of the research. Uh, immensely, thank you so much, dear audience, my colleagues, for watching this video. So please feel free to ask if you have any question. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, um, we don't have a lot of questions from the audience at this point, but let me, let me pose a couple of questions. We, we can turn to them. And thank you all for you know, being so concise and for such terrific presentations. Um, it seems like that all of the papers that we're discussing have this common thread of how to best and most legitimately, I guess, assist refugees in these protracted situations. And, um, and also how to conduct research in kind of the most effective and ethical and respectful way. And I wonder um, if I could just uh, tease that out a little bit, if you all would like to kind of address or speak a little bit more to an audience that might not be, that might be more of a, um, a generalist audience on the benefits of localization approaches, bottom-up approaches, and on the other hand, the pitfalls of the alternative types of approaches, which in some of the papers are called, you know, extractive approaches, for example, or top-down approaches. So let me just um, let me just put that out there. If anybody wants to to speak to that issue in particular, any of our panelists. Yes, Ludger. Well, if, if, if nobody is uh, raising his or her fingers, just, just a brief comment. I, I very much admire the uh, three papers I, I just heard uh, about the role of migrant organizations and, and the relevance uh, of localization um, and of migrant organizations. I think it's very important and perhaps as a question to, to the three other papers, um, how these migrant-led organizations, as you named it, for instance, are related to other kinds of migrant or refugee-related organizations. We called it RRO, refugee-related organizations, including even policy or border uh, uh, control, because we, I think we have to think of the whole network of organizations and NGOization, I didn't know this time, this term uh, neither, uh, is I think uh, the danger of being marginalized uh, at the local level and uh, uh, could be um, 
uh, in disadvantage of raising the voice of uh, refugees and their activists um, at, at the national and international level. So how to relate them local and specific organizations with a broader uh, organizational field? Um, if I may, Don, uh, just to, uh, hello everyone. I guess my name is Red and co-author there. I'm Mustafa Hushman, what was nice the co-author. And I was the lead researcher here in Turkey on the refugee led organizations studies in the Middle East. So just to have a synthesis of answer for both of uh, Don's questions and uh, Ludger's comments. So uh, if you're talking about localization, so we have the matter of uh, since grand bargain in 2018, uh, 16, sorry. Uh, what happened was the stress of international community of uh, empowering or localizing the aid uh, to the refugee uh, refugees themselves. It could be, as Luker said, the, through refugee-related organizations or as we studied it through the refugee-led organizations. So here we have to uh, somehow see the, the but I don't want to call it impact, but the, the effect that these two different groups, if I may call it, they create. So uh, in our study, what we saw was, uh, we saw the numbers on Ludger's paper, that the refugee-related organizations, we saw the amount of money is basically being transferred internationally uh, for the aim of helping refugees internationally. But uh, what we saw in our work for RLOs and for, in terms of localization of aid, we saw that a really teeny tiny amount of money comes to these refugee organizations, if I may call it organizations, because as my colleague Watva said, so we have a spectrum for these organizations, be it from a really small, teeny tiny group of refugees coming together to serve their communities, and uh, until a really large uh, refugee organizations like Basman Zaytuna in Lebanon, and we have uh, Syrian Forum, for example, in Turkey. Uh, so here is the question as actually that what we really mean by localization of aid. So is it just like, again, we don't give a seat when it's like at the higher tables at the UNHCR that the localization is being discussed, but the refugees are not there. So if we want to somehow talk about localization of aid, we have to make sure that the refugees themselves, either as individuals or groups or organizations has to be involved in the discussions internationally because they know their communities, they know the needs of their communities and they know what is basically, what agenda is, is needed, the agenda that they have to be implemented on different countries because uh, what we studied in these three countries in the Middle East, Turkey, Lebanon, and in Jordan, while everyone might think that the policy could be same, like more or less the same, but it's not the case. So Turkey, we have the signatory of 1951 convention. It has different policies vis-a-vis -vis refugees. And then we have Jordan and Lebanon, which is somehow uh, restricted when it comes to uh, refugees. So I guess it's, it's again, the, the, the matter of the bottom-up looking, like who is basically talking and who is basically being the receiver of information and who is uh, have a word in the in the uh, tables when it's such the questions are being discussed and uh, another uh, note on marginalization so in our study what we basically found out is uh, we saw groups that we call it marginalized group within marginalized already marginalized groups so we have like a group of refugees who are basically already marginalized but within those groups, they have, we have another groups that is marginalization. So all these topics together come back to the matter of localization of aid, that uh, what we really mean and what we really want to do and implement via a localization of aid and the policies being implemented uh, on this matter. I hope that answers the question. It does, thank you. Others? Can I? Can I add one point? Yes, please. Thank you. So I'm also interested to share some of our experiences of localization uh, project here in Cox's Bazar. In 2020, CPG was commissioned by localization task force that was central uh, agency, a combination of agencies of international organization and embassies of Bangladesh. So during the study, we have observed that one of the big challenges of this localization is lack of understanding of the definition of localization among the actors. Especially if I say about the uh, local uh, people, they are thinking that localization is the integration of the refugees within the community. That is really very much not a welcoming um, approach in the host community. And among the uh, international community, they are thinking that 
especially the inter, uh, especially the staff of uh, international organization, they are thinking the disengagement of their participation or the role in this process. But ultimately, we have evolved new version of definition of the localization that is not disintegration, but also the embedded approach where international community will share their expertise and the local actors will share their local contextual knowledge. So it's not actually a kind of uh, separation of our uh, delegation of power, but also uh, participate in according to their capacity, according to their knowledge expertise in a very shared approach. So these are the one things that actually lacks among the actors. Another thing is lack of the political will and also the policy restriction, especially here in the Cox Bazar, Rohingya refugee, they do not uh, recognize as a refugee and they have uh, actually the barriers to open bank account or legal status that they can also uh, receive the fund. Uh, at the same time, they also do not have any other uh, civic opportunities where they can create a group and implement their project within the uh, community. Uh, that, that also not allowing them to be part of the exactly what the means of localization. So finally, uh, one of the things that we have observed here in Cox Bazaar is the local organization received a number of projects from the international community and they engage many local actors as their partner and they are working separately. Then the all tensions and many other rumors against the international organization and also among the local group of people was uh, particularly diminished. So the localization, finally, we have understand that it's not only a concept, it is a a uh, sharing of power at the same time, sharing the access to resources. Otherwise, the true concept of localization would not be possible in the real sense for the sustainable uh, development of the community. Thank you. We do have a question, but I'm not I'm not sure if it's a question so much as just kind of a a, a comment or a inquiry. But it's, I'm an anthropologist and use participatory video training as a research tool, in which refugees are able uh, to produce their own film documentary about the needs and view on particular subjects. Are you familiar with this tool and are you using it? The tool gives empowerment on a personal level and creates bottom up insight and in needs and solutions proposed by the refugees themselves, also to be implemented on a policy level. Anybody familiar with that tool? Anybody think it's a good idea? Have you used it? Have you seen it used? Okay, let me let me um let me ask this question, which is not so much about the papers. And that is um we were we were hoping that perhaps some of you would be willing to provide updates on the particular protracted refugee situations that you wrote about sometimes you know months ago or even more than that um, based on things that have happened recently would, would anybody be interested in doing that willing to do it yes please Ludger. Sorry for raising my finger again, but I mean, if you take the Turkish situation and my colleagues could um, uh, tell, uh, share their experiences even better than me, but if you take the elections in Turkey right uh, last uh, Sunday, we see how the how crucial the impact of forced displacement in Turkey is uh, intervening and influencing uh, elections and I think um, finding um, a, a solution, an adequate solution and taking responsibility by the European Union, for instance, and the international community is crucial um, if we don't want uh, nationalists uh, to compete each other in the next two weeks of who is able to externalize more refugees from Turkey to uh, Syria, uh, etc. So I think there's a very important update uh, in, in the region, in, in, in the Middle East. And another point, just to one question, I think the localizing of uh, refugee-led and um, uh, refugee-related organizations is crucial, but a question, 
don't you think that we also need a transnationalization of refugee uh, relevant organizations because if we only have the local focus on the local level in geneva there are no uh, uh, refugee representing refugees representing organizations yeah abdurrahman can you jump in yeah a um, bit of update maybe on, on the somali refugees in east africa so as i have tried to explain earlier um, Ethiopia and Kenya both share border with Somalia in different sites, and they both now host refugees uh, from Somalia. Um, these refugees have been protracted. Um, Ethiopia, for instance, more than 30 years, and, and actually more sometimes in some areas. And um, what, what we try to also depict in the article, but also what I want to share here is that uh, the problem not being only the impacts, but also um, the problems also continues that Somalia still remains to be in the same situation that produces refugees in Ethiopia, uh, the neighboring countries where Ethiopia and Kenya are part of. So up to today, uh, there are refugee influx coming from Somalia to Ethiopia still, and there has been no durable solutions, durable solution in the sense of the three uh, options that we can talk of uh, so far. Um, fortunately, in 2016, as you may be very well aware of, then the, there was a move towards the local integration, and then the, you know, with the New York Declaration, the global compact on, on refugees and all these efforts, then uh, 15 countries became a CRRF pilot countries where uh, uh, local integration was specifically being uh, sort of tried or implemented. Ethiopia was one of them. Kenya recently also joined that bandwagon. Um, however. Um, maybe given other pressing priorities and the reality that most of the countries in the global south hosting refugees are also dealing with their own issues, including call of internal displacement is um, political and other uh, economic turmoil within their borders. These policies only remain to be on the documents as for as the case, for instance, in Ethiopia, where you have all the, you know, bleaches, uh, you know, cascaded down into policies that are clear, but then no manual is asked to how to implement and no one actually is sure about how to proceed with that. And therefore, refugees remain to be in the same situations in these countries. And, and that's why I think, um, and this is what we also argued in the article, we believe that we need maybe to think of more, um, particularly for those um, organizations like the UNHCR who are at the forefront of implementation of uh, these policies. We need to think maybe of other ways, alternative ways to the existing durable solutions, which we have already seen um, um, are not being uh, functional or more or less, or the countries are not willing to implement despite the breach that they have made. So that's a good update and, and yeah, thank you. Thank you. Let me, um, let me just ask one question that's appeared, which is what's your take on youth involvement in these RROs and RLOs? Do you think that youth involvement is essential for effective localization. And I'm sorry, I didn't see, is, um, I don't know you by, is it Mustafa Hashman, is that right? Yes. 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 Uh, but so I don't know how much time we have, so I'm just trying to wrap up all the questions. Uh, regarding the, uh, your question, your remark on, on, on policy of the state. So, uh, Let's give an exact example from Turkey, as uh, Ludwig said. So what we're having, it's happening in Turkey is basically we have the elections. And uh, as Ludwig mentioned in the, his paper, it's like we have the issue of refugee, refugees here, at least in Turkey, being tokenized, tokenized in, in, in many dimensions. First is like basically uh, nationally in the country as uh, so you may know more or less what's happening in Turkey, that the opposition parties are coming up and say that we're going to de deport all the refugees. So some say we're going to do it in a gradually manner. Some say that we're going to do it like on the spot if we win. So it's, it shows a matter of tokenization of refugees that no one is basically caring about like who we are talking about. These are like human beings we're talking about. So that's one. And, and the other part is a tokenization in in. Uh, in the field of international humanitarian sector. So we have, um, so I don't want to give names. So we have a project, for example, from EU being implemented in Turkey. And then you see a couple of pictures being taken from a discussion groups. A couple of refugees are sitting there. And then it's just like, okay, we have refugees involved in this project. 
project or what our program it is. Um, regarding the comment from uh, Ludger's comment on transnationalization of uh, uh, the um, uh, RLOs uh, or refugee organizations, I guess more than that, of course, it's, it's, it's necessary. But before that, we need a uh, comprehensive, thorough policy on recognition of refugee organizations internationally. So we need the two, three months ago, I guess, a uh, definition of RLOs came out by the UNHCR. So uh, given that definition, we have to give them international uh, recognition that what is an RLO and who are these people, what are their agenda and how they are working and how they are basically functioning in the countries. And other thing is just if we have the um, recognition internationally and by law, so what we have is like basically by passing the restrictive environment uh, in any uh, uh, every country, be it Turkey, Lebanon, or Jordan, because every country is basically implementing different policies on refugees uh, or, or on controlling them or monitoring them or basically on their rights to, to mobilize or to group or to create uh, their own uh, actions. And on the last question of the youth uh, involvement, uh, so what we saw in our uh, study, we mapped over 300 different refugee organizations in Turkey, Lebanon, and in Jordan. And uh, so if I want to talk from Turkey, more, my, my colleague Vatvami can, uh, can give more remarks on Lebanon. So what we saw here in Turkey, at least, is something that what we call it in our report, the shift of the roads. So what we had, the elder back in their countries that they're basically leading their, their, their communities, for example, in Syria or in Afghanistan or in Iran, now they have shifted that role to the youth. So we have these young people who can talk the language, who know basically the, the, the environment of Turkey, how is the system, how they can be better integrated or basically live together with Turkish communities. And now the, the, this youth have the role of leading their communities. And we see that elders uh, from uh, different nationalities, from different groups are basically supporting these youth in, in, in the matter of uh, whatever action they're doing through their uh, agency, uh, by refugee organizations or refugee initiatives. Thank you. I, th I think we should probably hand it over to you at this point, Beth. There are a couple of questions and points of clarification that will come in, but we'll have some time at the end to uh, have more questions and more of an exchange. So th thanks very much, everybody. Yeah, and thanks. And welcome to the second panel of this marathon as we look at protracted displacement and the articles that were included in this in this special issue. And we're gonna focus somewhat on protracted internal displacement, but as we'll hear from a couple of the papers, you know, sometimes it isn't just IDPs, it's other groups of displaced people, whether refugees or returnees or asylum seekers or people in transit. Um, yeah, when you look at protracted internal displacement, as Kim Mancini mentioned a few minutes ago, I mean, the statistics are really staggering, both in terms of the number of IDPs in the world and the length of time they spend in being displaced people. You know, our statistics on this are not very good. We don't have good tracking of the dynamics of internal displacement. You know, sometimes we get these shots or screenshots at moments in, in time, such as IDMC produces every year. But we know that displacement is a dynamic process that isn't just that you're displaced and you stay in one spot forever, but frequently there's a lot of movement that, that's going on. We're going to hear from three of the authors of, of our papers um, in this session. We've asked them to do the impossible task of summarizing long papers in just five minutes. And kudos to the first group of panelists who managed to do this. Uh, you know, those of you who are academics know this isn't our, our strongest point, being able to summarize complex issues in such a short amount of time. But we appreciate your efforts. We're going to start with the case of Mexico, and we'll hear from Isabel Jill Everett, who together with Claudia Masterer and Oscar Rodriguez Chavez, wrote a really interesting paper entitled Concurrent Displacement, Return, Waiting for Asylum, and Internal Displacement in Northern Mexico, looking at the complexity of dealing with three different groups. I'll go ahead and introduce the other two panelists now. But after, after Isabel speaks, we'll hear from Jennifer Wistrand, who is a cultural anthropologist at the University of Miami, who's also done quite a bit of work with the World Bank. 
including field research in Azerbaijan. And she's going to talk about this internal displacement situation that's been going on for a long time and look particularly at the possibility that development approaches may provide an answer to resolving this long-term displacement situation. And finally, we'll have a comparative paper um, by, presented by Catherine McCann, who together with Fuad Fuad, um, Arturo Harker Roa, and Monette Zard wrote a, wrote a paper looking at integrating um, through health during protracted displacement, really comparing the situation of internal displacement, displacement in Colombia with, with the situation in Jordan. So we have three different papers, three different parts of the world, and as we'll see, somewhat different approaches to finding solutions to complex displacement situation. But we'll start with Isabel Bienvenida from the Colegio de Mexico. I'm talking about the complicated situation in Northern, Northern Mexico. Thanks for joining us, Isabel. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Beth and Don, and, and thank you everyone for the, for the invitation to CMS. I, I'm Isabel, and I think, I believe Claudia and Oscar are also here as co-authors uh, to answer some questions and to uh, participate in the, in the seminar. Uh, so our paper, as uh, Beth was saying, we wanted to talk about the contemporary uh, mobility and immobility dynamics in Mexico. And it's, it's very hard to talk about what's happening in Mexico in the past uh, years or a decade. Uh, without thinking of uh, protracted situations of displacement. And uh, we wanted to talk not only about refugees and asylum seekers, but also about IDPs, and also about uh, returnees and, and deport, uh, people who've been deported from the US. Because we believe that if, we, if, if you look at Northern Mexico and the, the border between Mexico and the US, uh, all these populations concur or co coincide in the in, in this territory and all faced uh, situations of protracted displacement or potential protracted displacement. Some of these are more recent arrivals, but that uh, by by looking at how things are, are going, uh, it's likely that we'll be uh, in situations of protracted displacement. So um, we with this in mind, we analyze uh, three populations. We analyze uh, internally displaced uh, Mexicans due to violence and insecurity. We analyze people who are seeking asylum in the US but are trapped in Mexico and are unable to go to the US to start their asylum processes and people who seek asylum in Mexico. And also we analyze, as I was saying, people who've been uh, deported from the US and people who return from the US, most of them family members of uh, the deportees. Uh, we, we focus on the Northern border and in this, uh, we we build on on definitions or another conversations on protracted displacement that go beyond the the, the legal scope, and that focus on uh, the interaction of displacement forces, marginalizing forces, and immobilizing forces. As these are words that are not ours, they're of uh, Krayler and and, their, and his colleagues. But we use this to 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 see how these populations have differences amongst them, but they all share some things. And some of the things they share are the conditions of uncertainty, the conditions of marginalization in many ways, the difficulties of finding a home and establishing a home and a routine and sort of regaining the, day, the familiarity and the normalcy of their day-to-day -day, uh, lives. And uh, how these are situations that are in some ways, the result of migratory and asylum policies, both in Mexico and in the US. So we analyzed some, some years of policies, maybe uh, starting with, I guess, the deportations in the Bush and Obama administrations, and then going to the changes in the asy asylum uh, system in Mexico and the US in, in most recent uh, years. That And we finished with Title 42, which we now know that is over a uh, and it's been a few days since it's over, so we'll see what that what that brings. And we use uh, census data and track data, where we define international and internal migrants due to mig uh, who have migrated due to uh, violence and insecurity in the past five years. And we get into the sociodemographic characteristics of some of these groups and see some differences amongst them. And also we analyze uh, how. Uh, Protracted, protracted displacement makes it very hard 
to find and build a home, which was what I was mentioning earlier, and how it's more difficult for some groups than for others, and how building a home is not only the physical home or the physical space, but actually this, this routine, this day-to-day -day life that involves finding a place to live in, finding a job, regaining social context and social uh, networks, and sort of settling in some place, and how protracted situations of displacement for all these populations imply that it's very hard to do so, and it's very hard to regain a normalcy in the day-to-day -day life. Uh, some of the things that we uh, that we find in this uh, statistical analysis is the concentrations of these populations in cities, in border cities, uh, differences in gender composition, for example, deported uh, deportees and return populations tend to be more male, uh, whereas international uh, internally displaced uh, Mexicans tend to be more female. Um, we find that there's uh, a large, and perhaps this is not surprising, but a, a large amount of people who are either homeless or in shared living facilities, which most be most are migrant shelters or other living arrangements. And most of these people are international migrants and asylum seekers, whereas other uh, Mexicans and deportees tend to share uh, households and have unstable uh, living arrangements. Uh, there's a huge uh, percentage of people who are unable to find jobs which is not surprising. And this is even more so amongst international uh, migrants and displaced people. So we have some other, I mean, this is just like uh, the so, some, some of the findings that you can see in the paper. But I think the most interesting thing is to try to think of, uh, I mean, for us, the most interesting thing was to find similarities am amongst these populations and see how policies are creating these situations of entrapment and, and, pro and protracted displacement that have consequences, I, I mean, I'm, macro consequences and regional and national consequences, but also very uh, pronounced consequences in the day-to-day -day experiences of these people and migrants and asylum seekers. Well, thank you very much, Isabel. I mean, when you look at the, the different reasons that people are moving, it really raises questions about what kind of policies are most most effective, but we can come back to that, I think, when we, we discuss in the, the Q&A. I'll turn now to Jennifer Wistrand from uh, Miami University, who will talk about development approaches in the context of protracted displacement in Azerbaijan. Welcome, Jennifer. Thank you. Um, I want to first thank um, Elizabeth Ferris and Donald Kerwin and Kevin Appleby, the entire team. For, thank you for letting me publish my paper with you and for the opportunity to participate in this webinar. Um, as Beth mentioned, the title of my article, it's a development approach to a protracted IDP situation, lessons from Azerbaijan. For those who are less familiar with Azerbaijan, it's a former Soviet Republic located in the South Caucasus. Uh, between 1992 and 1994, it fought a war with Armenia, which is another former Soviet Republic located in the South Caucasus, over the region of Nagorno-Karabakh. So during the Soviet period, Nagorno-Karabakh was a part of Azerbaijan. However, its population was mixed. It was composed of both Azerbaijanis and Armenians. And there were some grievances between the two populations. When the Soviet Union officially dissolved on December 25, 1991, the two populations' grievances with one another escalated into an armed conflict and continued until the continued until the declaration of a ceasefire in May of 1994. Armenia succeeded in taking control of Nagorno-Karabakh as well as parts or all of seven adjacent Azerbaijani regions, which collectively comprised roughly 14% of Azerbaijan's territory and resulted in the displacement of more than a half million Azerbaijanis. In 2016, Azerbaijani and Armenian forces fought a four-day battle that resulted in land changing sides for the first time since May 1994. Then in 2020, Azerbaijani and Armenian forces fought a much more intensive six-week war that effectively reversed the outcome of the 1992-1994 war. Following the declaration of a ceasefire in November 2020, Armenia was forced to cede to Azerbaijan a good portion of Nagorno-Karabakh as well as the greater share of the adjacent Azerbaijan regions it had captured during the 1992-1994 war. Unfortunately, many of the Azerbaijanis who were displaced in the early 1990s remain displaced today. And according to the Internal Displacement Monitoring Center, as of the end of 2022, 
Azerbaijan's IDP population was estimated to be 659,000. So the research upon which my article is based is twofold. First, between 2006 and 2008, I spent 22 months conducting research for my PhD in anthropology in Azerbaijan among several different communities, one of which was a community of IDPs who lived on the outskirts of the capital of Azerbaijan. At this time, most of Azerbaijan's IDPs had been displaced for 15 years. Over the course of my research, which involved traditional anthropological participant observation, surveys, and formal in-depth interviews, I observed four characteristics that collectively distinguished IDP communities from non-IDP communities. These characteristics were one, housing that fostered insular communities, two, schools that fostered insular communities, three, limited employment opportunities and incomes, and four, poor mental health. A decade later, I had the opportunity to do two consultancies with the World Bank's Azerbaijan IDP Living Standards and Livelihoods Project, first in 2017, and then again in 2019 and 2020. By this time, most of Azerbaijan's IDPs have been displaced for 25 years. So someone who's been studying Azerbaijan's IDPs, economic and social circumstances, in the context of their national governments, domestic, regional, and international agendas for more than 15 years, I can recognize when an outside intervention such as a World Bank Development Project is having a genuinely positive impact on the intended population. In this case, that population was the IDPs who had been confronting economic and social obstacles that were directly or indirectly a result of some of the decisions their national government had made, particularly with respect to their housing and their schools. The Azerbaijan IDP Living Standards and Livelihoods Project understood and operated within the compliance of these strains, and some of its lines of effort tackle these constraints in ways that will have lasting positive impacts on the IDPs, irrespective of the outcome of the November 2020 ceasefire agreement. So this leads me to the article's policy recommendations, which hinge on the differences between refugees and IDPs and the differences between humanitarian and development approaches. I discuss these differences at the beginning of the article so that I can return to them at the end. So the article's first two policy recommendations advocate for reconsideration of the way future scholars, practitioners, and policymakers of forced migration are trained to understand and approach IDs, IDPs. While the article's third and fourth policy recommendations advocate for the expansion of existing humanitarian and development approaches focused <laughs> on IDPs. So policy recommendation number one. At present, IDPs are frequently sidelined in academic courses and degree granting programs about forced migration, where the focus is largely on refugees. Too often, IDPs are simply presented as a variant of the former. However, IDP circumstances, which are constrained by state sovereignty in a way that refugee circumstances are not, merit serious discussion and analysis in their own right. There should be academic courses about IDPs like there are academic courses about refugees, and degree granting programs should give equal time and attention to both kinds of displaced peoples, as well as to individuals who fell elsewhere in the refugee IDP dichotomy. Policy recommendation number two, a case study approach of development approaches to different stages of internal displacement should be developed with particular attention paid to solutions to the circumstances in which IDPs find themselves, especially protracted IDP situations. A case study approach would also be an effective way to present the refugee IDP dichotomy, including the gray areas in the existing legal definitions and the attendant humanitarian and development challenges those gray areas present. Policy recommendation number three, given that a national government can deny its IDPs the ability to avail themselves of traditional durable solutions in a way that the international community cannot similarly deny refugees, the development community, which is primed to work with national governments, should be involved in all high level and on the ground discussions that, about support for IDPs from the moment internal displacement occurs. A strong development perspective on the early stages of internal displacement, in addition to traditional humanitarian focus, might help reduce the number of IDPs who find themselves in protracted situations. To be clear, the humanitarian community should continue to take the lead in all displacement situations. However, it should have the de development community working with it from the beginning, and it should be ready to pass responsibility when the development community is prepared and able to work with the national government with respect to the durable solutions. Finally, policy recommendation number four. While my article focused on one case, Azerbaijan, and one kind of development actor, the World Bank, there's no reason why development programs focused on IDPs could not include organizations other than the World Bank or apply to other world regions. 
such as Latin America, where there are a growing number of refugees and IDPs and others in refugee-like and IDP-like situations. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer, it's fascinating. Um, I'm gonna turn now to Catherine McCann, but encourage you to put questions in the Q&A and just a heads up, uh, the first question I'll start with after Catherine's presentation will be to look more at this difference between solutions for refugees and IDP. So you might be thinking about this, but for now, let me turn to Catherine McCann, who together with her co-authors looked at health issues in Columbia and Jordan. Welcome, Catherine. Great. Thank you so much, Beth, and thank you so much to the entire CMS team. Um, I'm very excited to be here with you all today to discuss our article on integration through health during protracted displacement. This article builds on findings from the Big Questions and Forced Displacement and Health Project, which was funded by UK Aid, the World Bank, and UNHCR. I would like to thank my co-authors, Dr. Fouad Fouad from the American University of Beirut, Dr. Arturo Harker Roa from the Universidad de los Andes, and Menezard from Columbia University, who made this work possible. As you have heard resoundingly from today's presenters, refugees and displaced populations are experiencing increasingly exper extended periods of displacement, and it is vital to identify, explore, and assess strategies for supporting these communities. In our article, we utilize case studies from Colombia and Jordan to explore strategies for health system strengthening and integration. As middle-income countries with long and complex histories of migration, these contexts offer an opportunity to explore the impact of historically differing national policies and funding structures on the capacity for integration of systems today, with a particular eye for sharing lessons learned across international and internal displacement settings. Health offers a unique lens to view integration challenges and opportunities in two ways. First, via the health system itself. Health systems are complex ecosystems which require significant technical, administrative, and financial support. And lessons learned from health systems have analogs across other service provision sectors, such as education. Secondly, health captures issues of integration through the social determinants of health, which include things like access to livelihoods, safe housing, and education. In emphasizing the importance of social determinants on the wider question of integration, health becomes a microcosm for assessing the barriers and enablers influencing integration policy. To explore these questions, we utilized a mixed methods approach, which combined qualitative in-depth interviews and focus group discussions with quantitative health facility assessments and demographic and epidemiological analysis of pre-existing data sets. Three themes stood out from our findings, the role of donors, the importance of data, and the need for an approach that aligns efforts in the health sector with broader socioeconomic integration initiatives. First, I'll speak briefly to the role of donors. The source of financing and interest of donors mediates the political context, which ultimately determines if, when, and how systems integrate. And donors play a key role in helping to create and sustain political will. In Jordan, international donor support is a significant contributor to both sustaining uh, both displaced populations and the general economy. The long-term presence of external funding has created an environment where donors have substantial impact on policy, while somewhat perversely, potentially constraining the ability of the country to build a robust domestically-based response through long-term and sustainable inv investments in system strengthening. We can compare this environment in which the international community has spent an estimated $1,500 per Syrian refugee to the context of South America, where the number is an estimated $125 per displaced Venezuelan. The limited external funding for Venezuelans has necessitated that Colombia produce largely self-sufficient sustainable funding schemes that have given the country control over programming and created incentives for integration. Now, this is not to suggest that decreasing the critical lifeline that is humanitarian, that, this is not to suggest decreasing the critical lifeline that is humanitarian funding, but to instead explore opportunities for restructuring donor state partnerships to promote a more sustainable response. Our second key finding relates to the critical role of data within health systems. Demographic and epidemiological data enables governments and service providers to plan for and respond to key health and non-health needs. Ideal data systems are inclusive of both displaced and host populations and are detailed enough to allow for disaggregation by key factors such as age, sex, and gender, while simultaneously safeguarding protection and privacy. This is, of course, easier said than done. Colombia and Jordan take notably different approaches to data collection and utilization. In Colombia, a strong social protection orientation underpins the data system. This is particularly true for IDP registration, 
in which efforts to bolster registration numbers have historically been accompanied by expansion of benefits. Yet, limitations remain. To address issues around privacy and the potential for data misuse, the humanitarian information systems in Colombia largely do not share identifiable information with the national system. And this has led to service gaps for displaced Venezuelans who have registered in the former, but not the latter. Conversely, in Jordan, decades of high tensions around migration policy and funding have created a culture of territoriality over the information systems. And a lack of coordination between agencies has led to health system information systems that are fragmented across provider type and funding streams. The third and final key salient theme uh, was that of the role of the whole of person approach, which links legal status, socio and economic needs and health. It can be tempting to treat health as a standalone technical issue, but we found in our research that across the board, cost was the number one barrier for accessing healthcare for both displaced and host populations. And I think this really highlights the critical role of socioeconomic opportunities and legal recognition. Here, we can see how Colombia's experience with IDPs has informed the country's response to displaced Venezuelans through the promotion of a relatively robust and inclusive registration system linked closely to service provision. But this approach is not without cost. Our project estimated that to bring Venezuelans to the same level of care as Colombians, it would cost the government 307 million USD per year. For many host countries, such an investment is simply not feasible without substantial international support. In comparison, the political and historical context in Jordan has led to a more fragmented approach towards integration. A stark example here are the policies regarding Syrians' right to work. While efforts to improve economic opportunities for Syrians have been promoted through the Jordan Compact, limitations of work permits to specific, often low-paying sectors limit opportunities and underscore the government's position that repatriation and resettlement is needed for long-term stability. Ultimately, a welcoming political context is critical to enabling integration. Where such space exists, aligning and coordinating international funding approaches is vital to supporting national governments. So too is harnessing data to create a comprehensive demographic and epidemiological picture that enables effective planning for health needs across both host and displaced communities. Finally, the experiences in Columbia and Jordan underscore that it is a mistake to approach health in isolation. Health is intimately linked to socioeconomic and legal determinants that influence health outcomes, and that, when addressed together, can also lead to a more sustainable health service delivery and service delivery in general. Thank you. Thank you very much, Catherine, and thanks to all three of the panelists for doing this amazing feat of summarizing your work in only five to seven minutes. Um, the floor is open for questions, comments. Feel free to use the, the Q&A button on your, on your screen. Um, but let me start with this question of differences in solutions to protracted displacement and refugee and IDP situations. And maybe turn to Jennifer first, since you raised this issue in your presentation, and, and then turn to Isabel and Catherine to see if you have any comments as well, as well as anybody else. Jennifer. Uh, thank you, Beth. Um, just, to, just to clarify, so just, just it, should there be differences in solutions? Is that what you're saying between the two? I mean, you, you mentioned in your presentation that finding solutions for IDPs is different than finding solutions for refugees or the whole issue of sovereignty, the role of national authorities. But I wonder if you wanted to expand on that a little bit. Sure, sure. No, um, yeah, I do think it is something critically that has to be discussed and addressed. Um, uh, you know, not to say that one group is in a more dire situation than the other, refugees or IDPs, but um, as we know, right, um, in the, the guiding principles, it states that the national governments are first and foremost responsible for dealing with the circumstances, and any group that comes in to help IDPs has is there at the, at the, the quest or the, the agreement of the national government, and so um, I know from having spoken both with UH, UNHCR and others um, in Azerbaijan, you know, they have to do programming that, that the government wants, right? And obviously, I think, and that's why I get back to, I think, in the initial stages of any type of displacement, any national government is going to want whatever kind of help that is, and it's primarily going to be the humanitarian community. But the longer that goes on, again, um, there's you have to agree to what the national government says, and that's where I think, given the strengths, you know, humanitarian and development, that they have different timelines, they have different objectives. 
And um, as I go into much more detail in the paper where I kind of delimit those two different groups, but the development community, they really, their work depends upon, right, collaborating with the national governments. And that's why I think since IDPs are by definition, they're subject to their national government. That's why I think those solutions have to take the national government more into account. Now, not to say that Certainly the other examples, you know, in the first panel certainly talk about Turkey, Jordan, all that. Obviously, you've got longstanding refugee situations there, which involve the national government. But I, I do think IDP circumstances are different because their first resource is their national government. Great, thanks. And, and Isabel or Oscar, I see, joined us as well. If you'd like to comment on solutions for these different groups of displaced people in Mexico. Yeah, I was just going to say that maybe Oscar was the one that might want to answer this question, but I don't know if he's here. Yeah, I think he's here. Oscar, can you hear us? Oh, maybe he stepped away for a minute. I think, I mean, one of the things that I can mention is that in Mexico, there's no law that recognizes IDP, uh, IDPs. There's been a process to yeah. to prove some laws, and there, there are local laws, but there's not a federal law that's been approved. So I think we, I mean, in Mexico, we still would need uh, recognition of these populations in order to do something. And I think, and Oscar might be able to say more about this, but a lot of the IDPs that we analyze in this paper are IDPs that are potential asylum seekers in the US. Yes, exactly. Right, so there's there's a sort of a, a I don't know the word in English, a, I mean, they come together in a, in a way. So we, you have to talk about uh, internally displaced people that have to re be recognized as such, and that then they will become asylum seekers uh, in another in another country. So, but I don't know, I think Oscar uh, could have something more to say. Maybe we later he can uh, participate if he joins the, the seminar. Thanks. Uh, Oscar, are you there? I kind of hate to put someone on the spot, who knows? Um, Catherine, do you have any comments about solutions for Venezuelans compared with um, the situation in, in Jordan? Yeah, so I think really building on um, Isabel's point around sort of definitions and identifying who is an IDP, um, visibility is a significant concern related to IDPs that, while present for refugees, functions a little bit differently. Um, and certainly within our, our research looking at Colombia, we found that historically, it, Colombia's ability to identify and register IDPs was was challenged. So in 2004, there was a very large household survey conducted by Los Andes uh, researchers that found you know, low registration rates, um, strong, high economic vulnerability, and poor mental health among displaced Colombians. Um, and that research really impacted and led to the ultimate passing of the Victims and Land Restitution Law in 2011, which combined and really sort of put in place uh, a mandate that um, structures would be put in place so that uh, IDPs could receive additional supports um, and receive, you know, when they register, receive additional uh, social supports. And so I think that that's something that certainly it depends on the political will of the, the country. And as, as Jennifer mentioned, the uh, IDPs are very much subject to the the sovereignty and the political will of the, the country that they're in. But when we see something like this, where you know some of the research then leads to action, I think that's one, one pathway that might be able to be pursued. Okay, good. And you know, um, uh, other comments or questions? You know, Jennifer, I'm struck you talked about the importance of working with national authorities to find solutions to protracted displacement. What if the national authorities aren't interested in finding solutions? Either it's not a priority, or in some cases, and it may even be the case in Azerbaijan, where IDPs are used for political reasons to show how uh, the, the effects of aggression by another country, for example, and there may be some political reasons for wanting to maintain that displacement. Yeah, I, I think that's a very good point, and I think that's in many cases, I guess, why I would advocate almost uh, confronting an, an IDP population is, is more difficult um, because you do, again, um, whether it's a humanitarian or development organization, they can't, they can't force themselves, right, into the country. But I would say, that's why I would say with respect to, um, again, getting the differences and the different relationships that humanitarian and development have with national governments to start with, um, development, a lot of their programs, um, I guess I would put it, 
it then becomes a very creative strategy for the development organization to figure out if they want to help this target population, but they know by being so kind of upfront with how they want to do it, that that wouldn't be well received, then how do you indirectly achieve that, right? And I think that development, because again, of its longer time span, maybe multifaceted programming has the latitude to be able to do that in a way that a humanitarian organization wouldn't necessarily not again, or, and this is why right. I, mean, I don't advocate, advocate for like a separation, but more continuation of the two, right? That humanitarian starts and then development comes in. But I, I think maybe the tool set, again, that the time frame, um, but yeah, I, I think that's absolutely a problem. Um, and, that, uh, and that's why, again, the way that programs are presented would have to be multifaceted with the objective that maybe you're not getting 100% of what you'd want to achieve, but maybe you're getting 20%. And at the end of the day, I think that 20% for that population is better than nothing. Okay, good. Okay, you know, I think we heard in the last panel the, the emergence of refugee-led organizations and, you know, a lot more importance given to them and finding opportunities to engage um, refugee-led organizations in, in very different spheres. We haven't seen so much of IDP-led uh, associations or organizations, maybe because it's more difficult for them to organize. Oftentimes, they're very dispersed within a community and you know, a lot of times IDPs don't want to call attention to themselves as internally displaced, but find protection and anonymity, which makes it more difficult perhaps to include them in, in some of the programming and policy decisions. But it would be interesting to see how that emerges. I, I think in Colombia there are over 1,500 IDP associations, for example. I might see a, a hand from Kevin Appleby. Hi, Beth, um, and everyone. Thanks for all your presentations. I just had a general question, and it, it could be answered by anyone on both panels who's still here. Um, so, you know, we've seen over the past year, two years, especially from a U.S. perspective, a lot of attention on certain populations that the U.S., for example, might have a national interest in, but also dovetails with the humanitarian interest being the Ukrainians and the Afghans as two big populations. But protracted situations such as those you've spoken about today don't get as much attention internationally. Um, and I guess that might apply more to the refugee side than the internally displaced side since it's a sovereignty issue there. But how, how do we draw more attention other than these beautiful papers, how do we draw more attention to some of these situations and make the case that these situations are as important as other other large global refugee populations that get more press attention and which the U.S. may be more involved in their situations? Uh, it's a general question, but it's sort of the question that's sort of hanging over all these issues is the fact they're protracted. And it seems as though the globe the global community uh, is not motivated to address these situations and, and seek solutions. So anyone who could respond to that would be appreciated. Thank you. Any responses? And when we know that the media has a very short attention span that, you know, you know Syrians, for example, were on front pages of newspapers for, for several years, and now they're not. And, and maybe the same will happen with Ukrainians, or right now we're seeing the exodus of people from Sudan. You know, the attention span is relatively short. So how to refocus attention on some of these protracted situations? Yeah, Catherine. Yeah, I think, Kevin, that, that is the question, right? Like that is the the underpinning of, of so much of what we all do is trying to identify ways to really highlight the the challenges that um, these communities are facing. And I don't have a solution, um, but I do think that really highlights the importance of sustainability and a sustainability mindset when developing programming and policy. Um, certainly right now we see in Jordan, the transition from largely humanitarian funding into a much smaller pot of some sort of development funding and some of the challenges that are associated with um, the decrease in services that that um, particularly Syrian refugees are receiving. So unfortunately, I don't have I don't have any answers, but I just want to echo your point because I think it's it's so it's so key. Yeah, and I think the question of interest in particular issues um, 
is related to funding. You see kind of drop-offs in international funding for these situations. I was struck, Catherine, by the difference between the per capita aid per Syrian refugee and per Venezuelan displaced person is, is pretty striking. You know, so it's a question of finances and pension and also energy. Um, let me ask another question. You know, this is basically a group of academics who are looking at the situation of protracted displacement and solutions. Why don't we see more academic research on solutions, on coming up with creative ways of ending displacement in these situations? Although, Ludiger, you probably weren't going to respond to that question, but you, but you can go ahead and, and, and um, intervene, and then we'll come back to that. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Kevin. Your question is is crucial. I think it and it moves all of almost all of us. I think uh, we, we, in our research, we we I think uh, two two uh, answers I would uh, suggest. One is we have to um, extend perhaps uh, the concept of uh, protracted displacement to what I would call. I think it's better to speak of uh, forced migration in a gen more general sense. Because if we think of climate change, if you put all the specific uh, um, groups of forced migrants into several boxes, in Europe, nobody will take care of, of Somalia or of, of uh, right. uh, et cetera. And, and in the US, they will uh, argue, well, we are taking in um, uh, resettlement uh, refugees uh, and this is what we are doing so i think we have to open the minds of politicians and civil society for the general situation of forced migration in 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 its different aspects and the next uh, decades to come will have hundreds of millions of new climate uh, change based uh, um, forced migrants this is one uh, aspect and the second is um, organizations and networks, refugee-related organizations and networks. Uh, I had interviews in, with a Syrian activist in um, in Turkey. She was uh, invited by IOM in, in Vienna uh, to a conference, and then she get a, got aware that in a conference um, dealing with refugees, there were almost no uh, refugees. Mm -hmm. So the, the presenta representation of specific social groups always is different. And the more marginalized and poor um, social groups are, the more different. Unions in Europe and USA or in many countries are quite strong, but refugees by definition don't have this kind of uh, representing bodies. and. I think we should focus more on the self-organization and uh, uh, giving voice to refugees by, by allowing to organize and by bridging between uh, organizing uh, refugees and uh, refugee-related organizations working from the Catholic Church to, to anybody else. This is what worked in, in, in Germany and in Europe in, in 2015-16 when, when, when people right. came uh, from the Balkans. Good. Well, well, thank you. And I see we have a question in the in the Q and A chat from Carmela Lupica. Um, how can we get the border governors in the USA to bus migrants to rural areas that need workers, since finding work in the large cities is difficult for migrants? Anybody like to take on that U.S. focus question? Right now, some governors in the southern part of the United States are busing migrants. Um, right now, it seems like they're mostly Venezuelan to large cities such as Washington, New York, Chicago, and, and elsewhere. And the question of you know, moving them to places where there are more jobs available and sometimes even a desperate need for labor in some of these communities might be an alternative. I can, yeah. briefly, I can briefly answer. I don't know uh, how can we get these people to bus people somewhere else, but I, I, I don't know if that would be the answer. Because I think a lot of these people that cross the border and start their asylum process, for instance, have to go to court and have to follow certain procedures to, fo to follow their asylum processes. So if they're bus somewhere uh, to get work, they might solve the, the employment uh, part of, the, of their needs, but there are other needs that they will be able to satisfy. So they're, if they're bus somewhere that takes them 20 hours to get to their court, a date when they have their asylum uh, process, 
I mean, I'm not, I'm not sure that would solve the whole situation. I think it's 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 so complex because they have to find the job and have some way of sustaining their day to day, but they have also legal procedures and bureaucratic limitations. I mean, I, I don't know. I, I'm not sure if that would solve their situation beyond who, how can, can we get the governors to do so? And, and another point is, I think the governors are busing migrants to these cities because they are so-called sanctuary cities. It's almost a form of punishment, if you will. Done. Yeah, just um, a shameless pitch here is that we we, do, we have a big report coming out on court backlogs and um, it's coming out soon uh, in the US, the backlogs are almost 2 million at this point. And in some places, the the delay is going to be about 10 years before people get hearings. So that that kind of plays into Isabel's Isabel's concern and her point. But I, I would say this, that I think that um, people are going to both rural and urban places where they think that there's work and where there's family that are assuring them that there's, you know, kind of livelihood opportunities for them and the ability to get stabilized and started in the United States. So I think I actually think that that's happening. Good. Anybody want to jump in on the question of how we can get more academic researchers to think about solutions for displacement? I see Jennifer and then Ludger. Did you raise your hand, Jennifer? Uh, yeah, I did. I, Luger, do you want to go first, though? I, I don't know if your hand was up first. No, please go go ahead, uh, Jennifer. Oh, no, I, I, I well, thank you. I, Beth, I just think your question is spot on. And I, I think it is a huge problem um, that there isn't more academic research pointing specifically towards trying to, it's fine to talk about the problem, right? But at some point you need to move the problem towards looking for a viable solution and whether or not that solution works or not, that's one thing, but at least trying to find some kind right. of solution. And so I don't have the answer. To that. I think part of the problem is the incentive structure in academia is not, you know, in terms of just publication, right? It's not um, towards necessarily focusing on solution. It's towards putting out right. theory more. Um, that's why I actually, I, I just applaud your guys' journal. I applaud this, this webinar about actually advocating for people to take a, a concentrated approach at looking at solutions. But I, I think it gets back to the incentive structure. And I think it's very unfortunate because there should, there's so much great research out there that could, again, not to say that it's going to have the silver bullet of what the solution is, but if you're not trying to look for it, you're certainly not going to get right. any closer. So that's right. Good. Uh, Ludger. Uh, well, sorry for <laughs> raising again my fingers, but I think it would be very interesting if, if the international scientific community uh, draws much attention to how um, Ukrainian refugees are uh, treated and managed now in, in Europe, because this is an exceptional situation. In, in, in Germany, for instance, all Ukrainian refugees have immediate access to a labor market, they have um, immediate access to social security, etc. Um, uh, they receive some 500 euros per month from immediately from the beginning. So we can deal with uh, refugees in a quite different way than we do right. normally when, when uh, speaking about uh, Syrian refugees. And it would be helpful to, um, if international uh, the scientific community uh, would have a look, a closer look on how this um, works on integrating these people or helping them to return to re re Ukraine, et cetera, et cetera. It's, it's an amazing, very important uh, uh, ex natural experiment to a certain extent. Good, thank you. And Abdurrahman? Yes, thanks, Elizabeth, and, and thanks, Kevin, for raising this question. I think this is the whole essence of um, maybe much of the work around the forced displacement, also specifically of this particular um, you know, issue, racial and human situation now. Now, like, uh, do you hear me? Or hey, you're breaking up a little bit. Yeah. Is it good now? It's better. Yeah. Keep talking. Okay. So I was just saying, like, I think this is the, 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 the essence of this um, issue, the latest issue of the Journal of Migration and Human Security. And there's no clear cut answer to it. But I think we need to revisit back what has went wrong with the way, you know, we implemented policies uh, regarding refugees, regarding 
internally displacing people as well. What has went wrong? What has worked? What has not worked? And what I want to share is the experience, at least from this part of the world. Um, much of the, you know, humanitarian intervention is remain to be top down here, like including the big, like, you know, global level policies, including the New York Declaration, the whole CRRF and everything. You go to the specific refugee camps in this part of the world and you ask them, um, at least, um, have they been aware of, have they been involved in? You go to the local administrations that are supposed to take over the responsibilities of the refugees in this part of the world and you ask, have they been aware of the situation? And, and, and the answer is absolutely no. We've been doing research 2020 on this matter. And we talked to more than 2,000 people uh, on these specific issues. And we wanted to know what was wrong with the local integration in Ethiopia. And part of it, as uh, you know, Professor Ludger has already mentioned it, it's refugees and internally displaced and other people of concern have not been given a representation. Right. Issues including the refugee-led you know, organizations that are more recent and others that you can you know, count on have already been a top down. And then the problem comes, and that's, I think, part of what inspired us writing, you know, um, this article, um, the local, you know, the local relationships that are bounded, that are you know, linked within the cultures, within the structures, have not been considered. Now, governments do not include refugees and those who are taking care of their business closely into the planning, planning level. And then when you come to the implementation, nothing works. Right, nothing works. So I think more emphasis is needs to be given what went wrong. Part of that could be engaging, giving more representation of these local people. Part of it could be even focusing more uh, on democracy and nation building and now getting back to the causes of this protracted displacement so that we can at least deal with um, maybe the protracted one and therefore we curb or stop the new influxes, because in this, the situation we are in here, we have a protracted situ you know, situation. As I said, my colleagues in the refugee camps are the same age of me, they've been displaced in the 1980s, and they're still here. But still yet today, as of you know, 2023, there are influx of refugees from neighboring countries, including Somalia now, including Sudan, including um, recent, even Ethiopia was producing refugees. So we need to maybe at the national level to focus, uh, at the international level, I mean, we need to focus more on democracy, nation building, and issues that are more important and absolutely move away from this humanitarian short cake, I mean, soft cake sort of implementation model into more sustainable development oriented uh, kind of implementation. I, I think that's uh, my few um, additions to the to question. But the answer is, massive and more than this yeah yeah thank you very much and also for raising the question when you address root causes you're often talking about rule of law and governance issues and we have one more question um, in the chat for isabel it says can you talk a little more about the deported population as displaced people and the implications of this on the migration debate so what are the implications of the deportees Yes, thank you. I think uh, what, what we tried to do in the paper is to, to reflect how for many of the deportees and their families, uh, the U.S. is their home. They've been there for right. very, very uh, long term. Most of them have children born in the U.S., so they're U.S. nationals. So the deportation of this mixed status families to Mexico right. uh, involves a seek to return home, which is the U.S., and a sense of displacement from their actual home in terms of belonging and their communities where most of the children were born and where and grew up in. So I think it's it's uh, I mean that that's the reason why we talked about the, the deportees and the returnees as displaced populations. And I think it involves uh, I mean in terms of what it involves for migration debates, it involves sort of questioning what it's the idea of returning home for deportees because you would you would think that people that are deported are actually returning home right. to their countries of origin but that doesn't mean home that means their countries of nationality but that's a different thing yeah thank you i mean in the case of people deported back to mexico whose children don't speak good spanish is, is one challenge for, for the authorities but well listen thanks to all of you for your attention this morning and for your ability to summarize your research briefly. We encourage you to read the full journal articles. We hope this just whetted your appetite. Uh, thanks to the Center for Migration Studies and Kevin for 
organizing this. And of course, to Don, my wonderful co-editor for putting this together. Um, but thank you all very much. And we look forward to reading future contributions of yours and to continuing the discussion. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you.